Uh, so thank you again, all of you guys that have joined me today. I sincerely appreciate it. My name is James Murphy. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent for UGA Extension Rockdale County. Uh, and today we are going to be talking about organic gardening. So to get started, I really wanted to go back a little bit. This is actually a little bit of a neat dive for me because uh, I think for so many folks, myself included, uh, organic gardening is something that is deemed as new. It is kind of a hot topic. Uh, and I think that's really only because it's just recently gotten very mass appeal, uh, especially with major grocery stores hopping on the train of at least carrying organic items, if not certain chains being devoted entirely to organic or locally sourced or, or sustainable uh, produce. Beyond that, there's also been a pretty big uptick in interest in farmers markets or even going to restaurants and uh, requesting that things be locally sourced. And of course, all of that comes back to folks having a personal interest in utilizing organic techniques. So uh, with all that being said, I, I wanted to go back to kind of the very beginning and that goes back to this gentleman uh, that I've got listed here, Sir, uh, Sir Lord Walter Northburn. Uh, coined the term organic farming in his book, Look to the Land, uh, during uh, World War II in England in the 1940s. And so this uh, really started the, the promotion of the idea of minimizing use of chemicals and using sort of more natural methodology, methodology I should say. Uh, around the same time, across the pond, over here in the United States, a gentleman, uh, J.I. Rodale, began popularizing the idea of organic gardening uh, to a different audience, to a new audience. Uh, and Rodale's impacts are still seen here in the United States today. The Rodale Institute is still active in organic research, uh, but uh, he wrote quite a lot about the ideas of how can we reduce our reliance on chemistries, uh, how can we make sure we are eating things that are sort of purely derived. Uh, and he really was forward thinking too, uh, especially when it came to dietary concerns. He had a lot to say about sort of uh, carbonated or cola-based beverages and, and uh, carbohydrates or sugars in the diet, uh, which at the time, you know, didn't really get the scientific uh, rigor, let's say, that they were probably due, but we were, of course, seeing some of this now uh, come back into relevance. Another major stepping stone uh, in the story of organics or reducing usage uh, I would be remiss to say, uh, if I did not mention rather, Rachel Carson and her seminal novel, uh, 1962, Silent Spring, which really went into the harms of overuse of pesticides, especially those that bioaccumulate or, or are sequestered in the environment. And so, of course, this, this is the story of, you know, when we start to see uh, these issues up the food chain, especially with, with birds and predatory birds, some of our raptor species, uh, Rachel Carson really shone a light on this, and I think it, it really brought it to the public. Uh, and so then from there, over the decades up until now, there were a number of kind of terminology changes uh, that kind of built off of this uh, foundation that had been started with sort of alternative agriculture becoming sustainable agriculture until the 90s and 2000s when we got actual federal uh, legislation to give us the Organic Foods Production Act and the, what we now know and are, are somewhat familiar with, the National Organic Program, or NOP. So with that history being kind of established, um, if you're coming to this talk, maybe you already have a bit of an interest in organic gardening, and this may be old news to you, but maybe this is, you know, you're just dipping your toe in the water. And so if you are, these are our basic tenets of organic gardening. This is what we uh, think of when we say the word organic. Um, our biggest topic that we're going to be covering today is this first one right here, which is the idea of feeding the soil. Um, the idea of feeding the soil means that conventionally we think of feeding our plants using fertilizers, inorganic fertilizers, but the, the organic mindset is to build and maintain a balanced ecosystem within the soil itself. So that is one that's comprised of all the essential nutrients of a, a happy and healthy environment for microbes, uh, for arthropods, for fungi to live and to help our plants to grow. 
building off of that, of course, uh, this is perhaps the most well-known uh, aspect of organic garden gardening is to reduce or eliminate uh, chemical inputs as much as is practical. Um, you know, there are some misconceptions about where chemicals exist in the organic space, but ideally we want to reduce our reliance as much as possible as sort of the organic mantra. We also want to utilize the natural properties of plants in a planned manner to maximize synergy. So uh, planning is essential uh, for gardening in, in any discipline, but certainly in an organic aspect, if you utilize the natural synergies or the natural properties of certain plants, uh, you can again reduce some of that alliance on, on chemistries. And then finally, we want to adopt a holistic approach to weed and pest management. And with that means, uh, you know, any sort of gardening, you're going to have to accept some amount of loss, but especially with organic gardening, when you are maybe not necessarily going to rely on chemistries that may rescue a certain situation, if you do get a pest infestation, you have to accept some amount of loss. Uh, and I like to kind of put this in a nutshell by saying that by going organic, you are exchanging the utility of chemistry, meaning the sort of force multiplication or, or the work that chemistry can do for the dividends of sweat equity. And that means you can still get a great payoff from organic gardening, you know, and some would argue much better payoff from organic gardening. Um, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. And in this case, uh, organic gardening uh, is hard work. Gardening full stop is hard work. Organic gardening uh, can be much harder work uh, depending on what you expect out of it and what you put into it. Uh, so before we get too far into this, I want to shout out an organization that I think uh, really does a lot of great work, and this is SAIR, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Um, we have a southern uh, wing of it that operates right here in our region, um, but this is an infographic I would encourage you all maybe after this talk to check out. You can just search uh, SAIR soil health infographic. Uh, you can find that pretty easily. But this is great because again, we talked about that first major tenant, that first major, major pillar is building our soil. And this is a great way where you can kind of click around this, this image it's got here, and it's gonna talk about all the different practices one can engage in in an agricultural context to help to build up that soil. Um, so organic gardening is a massive topic and or organic farming is perhaps even larger um, but I will say that this is a great kind of primer to get started on, uh, and Sarah is a great group uh, that we're happy to have as a resource in our space. Another organization that I want to point out to y'all is OMRI, or the Organic Materials Review Institute. Um, so I think a lot of people have questions about when it comes to using compounds in their garden, uh, whether something is organic or not. Uh, well, this is the organization that will actively uh, catalog the materials that are available for certified organic operations. Now, if you are not a certified organic farmer, meaning you, you do not carry USDA uh, certification, you are not bound by this list. However, if you have questions about, uh, you know, is something organic, is it not organic, uh, this is a great way you can go. They have a digital uh, database that you can search through and you can also order print copies if you just wanna have one on hand. But of course, this is something that's gonna be updated continually. So a, a print copy may be lacking in that regard. So without further ado, let's get into kind of some of the practical aspects of organic gardening. And we will start uh, at perhaps the most common point uh, of any gardener, whether they be a vegetable gardener uh, and a, an ornamental gardener, um, a hobbyist or a professional, which is starting from the ground up. Uh, and by the ground, I do mean the soil. Um, so this is truly one of the most bread and butter services of our office uh, is soil testing. Uh, and we, we talk about this so much because how can you possibly build your soil uh, if you don't know what's in it. Um, you can, you know, certainly use guesswork. You can, you know, if you have been somewhat of an avid gardener or you already have some basic rules of thumb as far as some of the stuff we're gonna talk about a little bit later in this talk, uh, you may have a general idea, 
uh, but you can't know without actually observing it, which is why we encourage folks, you know, to, to work with our office or work with your local extension office if you're, you know, uh, not in Rockdale or maybe not even in Georgia, depending on where you're, you're tuning in from, and try and get your soil tested. And we generally recommend this be done about every one to three years. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover the process. I can certainly um, send you all the information after the fact if you'd like. Uh, but basically why we encourage this is we want to uh, allow you to use these results to uh, build that soil and foster a healthy environment. So I think we've had somebody join recently. If you are unmuted, if you could please mute your microphone, getting some background noise. Uh, a Garzinski, perhaps, um, that would be really great. And I'd super appreciate it. No, sorry, James. I'll go and look for them if they haven't, but it looked like I had tried to, to mute all when they came in. But. Okay, it's all, it's all good. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I want to emphasize, uh, if you're not an avid gardener, uh, that building the soil is something that is a process that is going to take time. This is going to be a multi- season at the minimum, if not multi-year process to effectively build that soil. So when we do soil testing, uh, this is what you will get back. Uh, you can get back a report like this. Here, uh, Greet Garcinski, can you please mute your microphone? Or Amy, can you please mute them? Thank you. Um, so this is the uh, results that you should get back. Uh, you're going to get a printout. And the things that I want to point out on this, first and foremost, you're going to get your macronutrients back. Uh, these are the things that are most important to our plants. So our N, P, and K. You'll see nitrogen actually isn't listed here um, because it's so transient in the soil. Typically, we don't test for it. We can do that separately if you'd like. Uh, but what we do show here, your other macronutrients and some of the micronutrients. Aside from that, we'll also show our pH level. Uh, so pH is one of the most critical uh, parameters in soil as far as nutrient availability to plants. And typically what we look for is something in the six to 6.5 range. Uh, you'll see that this soil report is actually for a Bermuda lawn. So even though it's, it's a little on the low side, it's acceptable for a lawn, but for, for most vegetable gardens, you're gonna want things to be in that six to 6.5 range. The other thing I wanna point out is we've got some text here at the bottom of our soil report. This is our recommendation. Um, and so this is what most people are actually looking for, is it's one thing to have the data, it's another thing to have the so what. Um, and so this is what you're really gonna want, what's really gonna be returned once we uh, send you your soil reports, you'll have something to act on, something to do with that information. So I do wanna touch on really quickly a topic that sometimes uh, gets asked uh, is the question of organic versus inorganic fertilizer. Uh, so I do want to say that plants do not know the difference between organic nutrients and inorganic nutrients. When we get down to a molecular level, nitrogen is nitrogen is nitrogen. However, organic fertilizers may provide the benefit of being more complete, and that is to say they may have a full complement of macro and micronutrients along with potentially beneficial organisms. So they may have you know, certain bacterium, they may have uh, certain fungal um, organisms that may be beneficial when adding to your garden. So even if you know, they're not necessarily uh, going to be able to tell a difference, uh, the plants that is, to be able to tell a difference, uh, organic fertilizers may offer certain other benefits. Uh, then again, organic fertilizers are often more costly. They're certainly going to be less concentrated, and they're not typically available in conventional ratios. So here's an example uh, of a spreadsheet showing uh, some of our example um, 
organic fertilizers. And so if you think of a typical garden fertilizer is 10, 10, 10, that is 10% each by weight of your major macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, you can start to get a sense for where some of these other things lie. And you can see, like I mentioned, in most cases, uh, they're just not anywhere near as concentrated. You're not going to get anywhere near the amount of fertility uh, out of an organic fertilizer as you would an inorganic fertilizer. Uh, another thing to pay, pay attention to is the actual availability of these nutrients. Um, so you'll see over here in, in the rightmost column, um, sorry, let me back up. The rightmost column, it'll show you that uh, some of these will be available fairly rapidly, uh, something like Chilean nitrate. Um, or wood ashes can it be absorbed rather quickly. However, in a lot of these cases, it's going to be a much more slow release. Um, then again, you know, when we talk about feeding our soil, you know, all of this may be part and parcel uh, of adding into and building our, our organic matter, which we'll touch on in a little bit. So um, again, you know, don't expect this to be a quick process or to start uh, rapidly, um, but this is just an idea of why, you know, especially for folks just getting started out with organic practices, you shouldn't necessarily shy away from inorg inorganic fertilizers, at least out of the gate, until you have better practices in place to where you can reduce your reliance on them. Another thing of note is when you get your soil tested, your recommendations will be in an inorganic format. However, Extension does offer some resources to convert your recommendations. So you can go through our soil lab, uh, which if you just searched UGA AESL, uh, the Agricultural and Environmental Services Lab, um, you'll be able to return this website, which will show you, um, it's about to get changed over, but it should have uh, some links to these calculators. So you'll have a fertilizer calculator, uh, which you can uh, change your recommendation over, and you can also calculate for a particular unit area. Um, especially if it's sort of an odd area, if it's not a perfectly rectangular or square garden, uh, you can uh, use this to actually get a better rec recommendation on how much to actually apply. There's also an organic fertilizer nitrogen availability calculator that will allow you to take uh, much more accurate uh, uh, recommendations from this based on what you intend to use. So even if you get returned an inorganic recommendation, we still have uh, organic recommendations uh, available through these conversions. So now that you've got your soil tested and you kind of have an idea in mind, uh, what now? Um, so as we mentioned, we want to feed our soil. That is the foundational building block upon which your garden will be built. Uh, so now we want to actually build our soil. So this will get into actually building sort of a natural fertility, a natural community uh, within your soil and also improving the organic matter. So on the topic of organic matter, uh, ideally um, when you're talking about the best of the best organic farms, um, say, you know, out in Hawaii or the Pacific Northwest or uh, up in New England uh, or maybe somewhere out in the Midwest, you ideally want to be in the range of three to five percent organic matter. However, I will say, practically speaking, at least here in the Piedmont of Georgia, typically we are well under 1%. So practically speaking, if you can strive to get to 1% to 3% organic matter, um, then you're probably doing pretty good. So uh, for an example, an acre of soil at six inches depth is around 2 million pounds dry weight. Uh, so that's, that's quite a lot, right? If we broke that down into something that is maybe on the order of a typical garden, around a thousand square feet, uh, at the same depth is around 46,000 pounds, which means if we want to increase that organic matter by even 1%, you'd have to add 460 pounds of material uh, tilled into that six inch depth. Um, and another note, uh, this is often an underestimate because in the case of a lot of our organic matter additions, they can have a lot of water. Um, and again, the take home here that I want to stress is don't try to do this all at once. If you have an unlimited budget, um, you know, maybe you can add a ton all at once and you can work it in. Um, but more practically speaking, it makes much more sense to try and build this soil year to year and use practices that are going to help you hold on to that soil so you're not going to be losing it 
uh, over the course of the year, especially if you're not always actively growing anything in that garden. So here's just some example of some organic matter, uh, and we're talking about amendments in this case. So these will be things that will actively be added into the soil. Uh, I will note also, we talked about soil testing earlier, and that was from a nutrient standpoint. Our lab can also test for organic matter, uh, and it's only $10, I think. So if you've, you're somewhere in the middle of this process, if you're on year one or year two of organic matter uh, addition or amendment, you may want to get it tested just to see kind of where you stand now. Um, but all that to say, what we have here is a list of two out of our four major components of a soil system, uh, which are organic components, mineral components, and then of course water and air make up the other components. If you are trying to select materials to add, uh, ideally you're going to be able to get whatever you want, but practically uh, you're going to have to select for what is available to you. Um, but you should also be conscious of some of the stuff that you're getting. Uh, you know, in some cases there's a lot of talk about peat additions. Uh, peat is not a sustainable compound. It is a great organic additive uh, and may be used in certain contexts, but in actual gardening, it's not sustainable. It is not produced enough to really be used in large scale applications. However, you can use other materials like uh, cocoa coir. Uh, compost is, you know, of course, a major one and composted manure and things like that. Um, all of this is going to have to be worked into the soil to a depth of around eight to 12 inches. You want it deep in that soil. Uh, so you're actually building that and it doesn't just sit on the surface. Uh, another note on compost is that typically it's going to be superior to fresh uh, residues or fresh manures because it's going to help you avoid issues with chemical residues and weed seeds. Uh, it can be a little less bioactive uh, than the fresh counterpart as in it may not have the, the microbes. And that can be a good or a bad thing because bad microbes can live in that as much as good microbes. Um, but it can also be a much slower or longer release uh, for the composted material and again help build that soil profile. So another question that it often uh, dovetails with a lot of organic gardening uh, is to till or not to till. Um, so tillage, for those of you who are not familiar, is the idea of actually breaking or, or working the soil to prepare the seedbed for planting, and it's really broken into two major categories. So on the one hand, we have what is termed conventional tillage, uh, and on the other hand, we have what is termed conservation tillage. So for conventional tillage, as I said, this is going to utilize something, a, some type of machinery or some type of tool like a tiller or a harrow or a plow uh, or something like that to actually prepare that soil to break it up uh, for planting. Uh, this is almost always needed early on in the development of a given area. Unless you have inherited an area that has been well cared for, it has been cultivated for years, uh, if you're starting from a residential area or even previous ag land, uh, that may have had uh, machinery run over top of it, um, that soil is going to be heavily compacted and it's going to be very hard uh, for plants to grow and also to integrate that organic matter that is so important. So even if you're against the idea of tillage, uh, if you're just getting started, you should probably at least think about it. And that doesn't mean you necessarily have to run out and buy a tiller. Maybe you can just rent one or borrow one from a neighbor, um, but tillage is probably gonna be necessarily at least the start of your organic practice. Um, so the reason for this is, as I said, it's going to allow for incorporation of organic matter to build that soil. It can also be very helpful in weed control, you know, especially for folks that are getting started in an area, uh, maybe in a yard. Uh, there are probably going to be invasive plants, whether they're weeds or whether they're turf grass, uh, that are going to be hard to get rid of and mechanical control, uh, which is great because it is, in a way, it's an organic practice practice, it, it's chemical free, can help rid yourself of some of these things in a space that you want to grow. One downside is certainly that it may contribute to increased erosion over time by breaking up the soil and loosening it. If you get a heavy rain afterwards, you can certainly have some runoff and you can have issues with erosion. erosion. Uh, so you do have to be very careful of, of timing any tillage events. Uh, and also on a large scale, it will release more CO2 per unit area. However, for your average home gardener, that amount is negligible compared to anything on a commercial scale. On the other side, we have conservation tillage. This is going to 
focus on reduction of mechanical seedbed preparation. Uh, and it's going to do this by utilizing cover crops or crop residues as part of an integrated system. Um, so these cover crops can have additional benefits outside of just weed suppression, which we'll touch on a little bit. Uh, but the downside of this is it certainly will add expense. Um, seed isn't free unless you have somebody giving it, giving it to you, in which case I'm very jealous. Uh, it certainly adds complexity, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something that is therefore going to require more research and planning because you have a more complex system that you're working in. So on the subject of cover crops, we will segue right into uh, the idea of green manures. Uh, so in this case, these are going to be crops that are grown with the specific purpose of building the soil. Uh, so this may be something that you do before you even think about planting your first vegetable crop. Maybe your first uh, crops that are grown are going to be green manures because you want to try and build your soil profile before you immediately get into vegetable production. And again, from the perspective of organic gardening, everything should be sort of long in scope. You know, we're, we're, we're extending our timelines for these things to be more sustainable in our practices uh, and yield better results with minimal inputs. That means we have to stretch our timelines. Uh, when we're talking about green manures though, one of the biggest ones that always comes up are our leguminous crops. So these are our beans and peas that can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil for other plants that will be planted after the fact to use. Uh, in tandem though, we will sometimes advise, depending on the context, to uh, co-plant to interplant grains and forbs that can help to break up that soil, physically break up that soil, uh, as well as hold on to it. Things that have a more fibrous root system that can actually hold on to that soil. And this helps build tilt, which is a term we talk about soil consistency uh, or, or the uh, amount of uh, fine to coarse texture or sort of a ratio within the soil for plants to get established. And so, as I said, you know, having a combination of, of two or more of these in a given space can have those uh, mixed benefits uh, that may be beneficial towards building your soil profile depending on your goals. So here's some of those other benefits of cover crops outside of just something like our legumes uh, fixing nitrogen. Uh, you, see, you can see this is an example from the Southern Cover Crops Council uh, and this is a freely available infographic online. Uh, we've got it through UGA I believe. Um, but you can see here uh, these different cover crops, these are all grains, summer grains I'll say, so warm season grains are rated uh, based on their uh, varying characteristics. So as far as being soil builders, uh, erosion fighters, weed fighters, some even have grazing uh, potential. So if you've got livestock or you're interested in having livestock, you may be able to plant some of these things that will help build your soil while at the same time providing a resource for your animals. So that's even, you know, something beyond just conventional gardening. Um, and so you can see we have multiple different characteristics here. One thing that's not listed uh, is cost. And so for many folks, again, if you don't have uh, an unlimited budget, you're going to have to take some time uh, to, to factor this in and say, you know, I want to be organic, I want to be sustainable, but how much uh, cost does this add to my practice? Um, and, you know, gardening, as I said, at the top of the talk is hard work. Uh, but it's also expensive for everybody who thinks that it's going to save you tons of money. Um, that's generally not the case until you really get rolling and maybe you're able to save seed and, and keep things going over rather sustainably. Um, but another thing to note is for some of these cover crops is they are edible and usable themselves. The residues, if they're not tilled in or, you know, uh, if they're not terminated early, you may be able to get something out of them. So there, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, a, a, a something for nothing or nothing for something kind of game. Another chart that I found uh, that I think is great is through the Agricultural Research Service, uh, who I used to work for before taking this job. And this is a periodic table of cover crops. And you can see that they're broken down nicely into their actual categories of grasses and broadleafs, as well as cool versus warm. And in the center, we've got all of our nitrogen fixing legumes. Uh, so this is great if you just want a quick reference guide. Uh, beyond that, they also will show you uh, the various growth habits. So they'll show you uh, the plant architecture. Uh, and something else important to consider from a gardening aspect 
how much water they're going to use. So some things will be very thirsty. Uh, you know, if you look at some of our, uh, our peanuts or our sunflowers, or if you're growing any, anything in our squash or cucumber family, uh, these things can be used as cover crops and uh, proffer benefits outside of just building the soil, but they can also be very thirsty, which is something important to consider in any gardening endeavor. So another question that I often get, um, and I, by the way, I do see y'all typing in chat. I'll try and address them at the end because I'm, I'm trying to keep moving in the interest of time. Uh, so if I've, I've covered your question, uh, I'm, I'm glad for that. But if I haven't yet, I promise I'll try and get to it. Um, but an, another common question I get is the utility or the necessity of organic seed. Uh, so organic seed, uh, much like organic produce, um, is equal parts uh, marketing as it is practice. So if you are not certified organic, it is not strictly necessary. So just like we mentioned Omri at the top as if as in, if you are not a professional certified farmer, uh, you are not bound by this. However, if it is in your practice, if it is something that you are interested in, um, I'm certainly not gonna tell you not to do it. Uh, the important thing to consider when selecting any kind of seed is that hybrid seed, uh, those that have been uh, bred uh, to be disease resistant, are going to make things easier for you or can help uh, reduce some of the headaches of gardening. That's not to say that any particular seed is going to be trouble free, um, but hybrids are bred or the lines are specifically selected in order to be uh, more uh, hardy to some of the conventional issues seen while gardening. Uh, the flip side of that is of course our heirloom seeds, which are also very popular, especially within the organic and sustainable uh, uh, umbrella, I'll say. Heirloom seed, um, may produce more flavorful or attractive plants. However, uh, they can be more finicky and oftentimes they're gonna be less tolerant of stress and certainly of pathogens. Uh, so if you are already well-versed and you have a green thumb, more power to you. You know, I hope that, you know, if you grow some heirloom tomatoes, you might consider sending some my way because they're one of my favorite things. But if you're a novice gardener, uh, don't let the allure of the heirloom name uh, necessarily uh, sway you to thinking that's your only option if you want good produce. You can get great produce from hybrid seed um, and you may have an easier time doing it. Uh, but as you get more versed, then maybe you can dip your toe into the heirloom water. So now we're gonna get into garden planning basics. Uh, again, this is for folks that maybe if, you, if you've never really done too much gardening or you're not too familiar with it, but your biggest concerns as as always, are going to be sunlight availability. Uh, so in this case, we're talking a minimum of eight hours available. I know right now in June, we're sitting at around 14 hours of daylight a day. Uh, so that's not, you know, you know, crazy huge, but we want around eight hours at least of sunlight. You're gonna need access to water. Um, you know, ideally this would be in some form of drip irrigation so you can deliver directly to the root zone and that'll help keep back issues with diseases as well. Um, but, you know, if your only options are a hose or overhead irrigation, that's okay too. Just make sure you have some kind of water. Uh, soil temperature is critical, uh, especially for planting. Uh, if you want good, vigorous plants, making sure that you're, you're measuring your soil temperature or checking online resources for soil temperature uh, to make sure that your plants are going to be happy when planted. And you also want to be aware of time until harvest. Uh, because, you know, you don't want things that are going to be, uh, you know, quickly turning over, you know, say sub 30 days, <coughs> excuse me, planted right up against things that are going to need a lot more time to mature. And then you're having to mess around in there and potentially damage things. So you want to plant things in groups by type. So solanaceous things, things like our tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, legumes, so all of our beans and peas and our brassicas, some of our leafy greens, uh, things like broccolis, uh, or our alliums, our onions, things like that, or by nutrient requirement. So certain plants are gonna be termed what's uh, uh, in terms of a feeder. So you have heavy feeders, medium feeders, and light feeders. And from a nutrient perspective, because some uh, crops may need some secondary uh, fertility over the course of the growing season, again, you don't necessarily want these interplanted because that can throw off the, the nutrients uh, within the soil. And, and you, know, you can actually have issues with toxic 
toxicity or with burn from over fertility. You know, if you have a light feeder right next to a heavy feeder and then you're trying to balance that. So keep that in mind when you're grouping things. When planting, uh, a good organic practice is to try and plant densely, uh, especially if you're sowing from seed and then thin manually so you can get good canopy establishment. You'll quickly uh, shade out the soil underneath to, to slow down weeds and then you can thin manually. Uh, you can you know, eat your sprouts, eat your small plants, and then you can use that to help prevent some weed competition. Uh, I will say also to utilize mulches, uh, cover crops, or physical barriers to help suppress weeds, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. So another core concept uh, of organic practice in the garden, this should be employed, I think, in all gardens, but it's especially important in uh, organic gardens is that of crop rotation. So as we just mentioned, our same types, and so these would be at our family level, our, our solanaceous, our legumes, our alliums, our brassicas, we wanna rotate those same type crops to different rows or beds every season. Every season might be overkill. Uh, you could probably get away with it, you know, every other year or something like that. But this is a diagram showing an example of that. So you can see in year one, we had our tomato in bed one, legume in bed two, carrot in bed three. And so then uh, the next year when we plant, we basically just shuffle those. And, and it's not necessarily crucial uh, assuming all things otherwise are equal for these beds in terms of sunlight, in terms of soil quality, what have you, it's not necessarily critical uh, that you go to any, any given one, just that you're in a different place. So this is, doing this is actually going to help reduce our chances at disease buildup because some de diseases are going to be more specific to certain plant types. So by rotating things around, you're going to avoid having plants uh, or disease uh, populations or, or disease reservoirs build up. Uh, also, as we mentioned with our cover crops, planting legumes will aid in returning nitrogen to the soil. So in this way, you can actually, you know, use something that you're going to consume, uh, you know, plant some beans or peas uh, that you're going to consume, and it will in turn help prepare that bed for the next season when you plant something else. And so, of course, our cover crops can also be integrated into this rotational system. So even if you're not necessarily interested in planting a given area for uh, a consumable crop, um, you can still help to build that soil to, to plant some green manure in the meantime and kind of leave it fallow uh, before you come back the next season and plant. So now we're going to get into some of our uh, pest concerns, which are always a hot topic uh, when it comes to dealing with pests in an organic matter. Uh, so the first big one is, of course, weeds. Um, so when it comes to weeds, the most common way to deal with them is going to be some form of mechanical control. And this certainly gets back to uh, when I talked about at the beginning the idea of exchanging the utility of chemistry for sweat equity or having to put in some more physical work uh, in order to yield the same or better results. Um, so in the case of this, when we're talking about mechanical control, we're going to be using either our own two hands, which are, of course, you know, are probably our best tool in the whole garden, uh, but also just using tools, uh, bladed tools, uh, anything that's going to allow us to go and, and actually cut biomass or, or remove it from the soil. So that, that could be using something like uh, tillers and plows. Mowers are, of course, very common, and sometimes these might be used, you know, on the margins of gardens rather than in the gardens themselves uh, because you want to avoid damaging any desirable plants. Um, and hand pulling is always uh, going to be the name of the game. Like I said, uh, your two hands are definitely uh, your best tools, uh, the most versatile tools, we'll say, in the garden. Uh, and so especially for a small garden, hand pulling is the way to go. Uh, as with all pest problems, and we'll touch on it when we, we talk about um, our, our insects, uh, you know, getting on top of these problems early is key. Um, you should be familiar with your garden, um, but before things become a big unmanageable problem where even, you know, chemistries probably wouldn't be able to help you out, even if, you know, herbicides might not be able to help you out, if you are on top of it and recognize when weeds are coming into season and what they look like as they germinate, um, you can know when to act and when to be out there and when to start pulling things. And that's certainly another way that the extension office can dovetail with your organic practice is to help you with identifying 
notification or provide you with publications about when these things are active. Another option that can be pretty fun uh, for weed control are propane burners. Uh, I've only had the pleasure of using these once in my life. I was when I was dealing with invasive weeds down in South Florida. Uh, they're exactly like they sound. They, it's basically a uh, length of tubing or pipe that you will hook up uh, to a propane tank and it's got a little igniter on it. Uh, and then you will get a very small flame, a directional flame that you can use to actually burn things. And so uh, these are great because um, it will not necessarily 100% uh, kill all plants. Some, some are uh, resilient to burning of that above ground biomass, but it's pretty great for just getting in there and spot treating, uh, especially if you have things kind of coming up between rows uh, or in areas, you know, maybe it's a little bit bigger or if it's something that you can't easily hand pull, if it's something that's a bit thornier or something like that is a potential option. Uh, uh, also in the realm of thermal control or hot water, um, hot water is certainly usable. However, you do have to be careful where you apply it because that hot water uh, can of course move across the surface and underneath the surface and really damage uh, root systems of desirable plants. So I would really do this gardens uh, or in areas that are gonna be isolated from uh, your, your garden itself. So one of the other things that I mentioned uh, for garden planning and practices is using things like physical barriers. Uh, mulch is the big one that comes up. Uh, and you know, people are always asking me, you know, what type of mulch should I use? Is there one kind that's better than the other? Um, and just like our organic uh, amendments, more often than not, it's going to be what is available to you and what is cost effective. Um, you know, there are certain things that are going to last a bit longer in the environment. So if you can spring for things like cedar mulch, uh, they're great. They, they look nice and they're attractive, um, but they can also be quite expensive. There are also um, uh, things that are not necessarily derived from an organic substance, uh, or they may be, but they're not, you know, a just a slightly processed organic substance, but things like fabrics. Um, and plastics are also utilized in organic culture because, you know, again, even if it is derived from chemical means, uh, it is not a chemical application. You're not having to come out and actually use uh, chemicals. Um, another one that's very common I see is newspaper. A lot of times people are asking me about it. I think newspaper is good as a base layer. I would not use it exclusively as a weed suppressant because it doesn't hold up well enough in the environment. Uh, which is in a way good, it biodegrades, uh, it'll be gone, uh, especially if left out, uh, exposed to the elements for too long. Um, but I would recommend putting something else on top of that, whether that, that be something else organic or inorganic is up to you. Another note that I wanna touch on is that some weeds are going to provide valuable floral resources for pollinators and they may actually have other services uh, that you know we'll touch on in a second for some of our other critters. Uh, and this is especially true early in the season. Um, so if you are not a year round gardener, uh, let's say you are a fair weather gardener, uh, even though of course if gardening more often than not, it's going to be rain or, rain or shine, um, you uh, are probably not going to have things out there for some of our pollinators, especially early in the year. And so some of our winter annual weeds, uh, things like chickweed or henbit, um, will provide some nice floral resources in February when some of our, our bees and, and other critters are starting to wake up. So you may consider just kind of leaving some things around or leaving them in small patches uh, if they're not too intrusive so that uh, you can provide some good resources for uh, your, your little garden friends. I do want to have, uh, before we move on, a note on sort of organic uh, chemical control or organic herbicide. So there's a number of different compounds, uh, vinegar, salt water, essential oils, et cetera. Uh, they certainly can provide suppression, but how, however, you really need to take care when you're making applications. It's just like with our thermal control, uh, these things are going to be indiscriminate. That is something that is really, you know, only the realm of inorganic herbicides is selectivity, uh, which is the ability to select for certain types of weeds uh, a lot of that you are going to lose when you go the organic route. And so that's not to say that these things aren't effective. It's just that you have to be very careful, especially if you have uh, desirable plants intermingled with 
weeds. Um, so absolutely take care and also realize that, you know, repeated application of things like vinegar, which is an acid or salt water uh, can degrade that soil and make it inhospitable for other plants. So now we're gonna talk about our insects, uh, pests in the garden. Um, and I do wanna just start off at the top by saying that organic insecticides can be just as deadly to bees and beneficials as inorganic. I think that's a common misconception that uh, organic somehow means uh, insect safe or safer. Um, but as we'll talk about in a second, that's, that's generally uh, not always going to be the case. Um, and just like with our weeds, um, to deal with pests organically, you should be spending lots of time in your garden uh, because scouting for these pests uh, and catching them when they're early is going to allow you to act and, and affect better control. Uh, if you catch organisms when they are at their juvenile stage before they've grown wings and have reproduced, you're going to be able to do a lot more control than you would be uh, otherwise. So going hand in hand with that, positive identification is key. And here's yet another way that our office can help you uh, is that if you have something in your garden, or even if it's not your garden, if it's in your home or you find it on your car, um, take some good pictures or uh, you know, throw it in a baggie and bring it by our office and drop it off. I'll put it in my fridge and we can get an identification for you to let you know if it's a problem. I just got one this morning about a stink bug that I'd personally never seen, but I took the time to identify it. And I was able to realize that it's, you know, it's a native bug, but it's not necessarily a pest species. And so that way you as a consumer can know, hey, this is just something that exists in my environment. I don't necessarily have to take, put the time and effort into pest control. With any kind of pest control, uh, whether it be for insects, or I will say also for our, our weeds, um, always read the full label and any accompanying documentation. Uh, as we say in extension, the label is the law and that is literally true. Um, it is uh, enforceable by law if it is used off target or if it's used in the wrong concentration and you could be liable for issues, never mind just seeing potential negative impacts on you know, your garden or potentially your health. So always be careful with this stuff. We do encourage as part of organic practice to consider using narrow spectrum. So something like Bacillus thuringiensis, which is targeted towards just caterpillar type pests over things that are broad spectrum, uh, things like pyganic, uh, which is uh, derived from chrysanthemums. It is a pyrethrin based uh, insecticide. However, it's broad spectrum. So it's indiscriminate, just like uh, some of those measures we talked about for our weeds. Uh, pyganic can be good in some cases, but we do have to be careful about application, um, especially in our gardens for some of our beneficial insects, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, one other thing, uh, if you're a gardener, you're probably, you know, you're not uh, opposed to using your hands and getting down and dirty, but just like with our weeds, mechanical control is a big part of our practice. So be prepared to grab and smash bugs by hand or under your boot uh, if you want to stay organic. Um, and so just understand that, you know, that comes with the territory. If you're squeamish about bugs, um, it's going to make it harder to control them. Another strategy you can employ when you're dealing with insects in the garden is a strategy known as trap cropping. Um, so this can, can be done in the case, as you see here, where it's planted on the margin of a garden. But in some cases, uh, you can also do it intercropped, which is to say uh, alternated or, or literally planted directly next to certain desirable plants. But the idea here is you are sort of planting a sacrificial plant uh, that is to be used as a barrier and early warning system. So you can see in this case, uh, the example that's being used is using a margin of sunflowers, which are an attractive resource uh, for leaf-footed bugs, which are a common pest of uh, many things, but you'll oftentimes see them on tomato, uh, okra, um, peppers, things like that. Uh, by having these planted, and the key is with trap crops, you need to plant them early so that they're going to mature in time to be uh, readily available while your other crops are still coming up, uh, um, they're going to draw some of these pests away and there are these areas uh, as sort of an or early warning system. So getting back to proper ID and knowing when to act early, if you start seeing things show up in your trap crop system, then you know you need to be on the lookout. You know you need to either uh, start 
uh, scouting the rest of your garden, looking for uh, clusters of eggs, looking for juvenile insects, or maybe starting to put barriers on things. Maybe if you have things that are just about to be harvested, covering those, covering those with something like a baggie or a row cover or something to keep those insects from getting on them. Um, so there's a number of different strategies for trap cropping. I'm not gonna get too far into it today, but I think um, aside from just the trap crop aspect, again, you can use certain plants in your garden, and this goes back to that synergy we were talking about, um, to not only uh, provide a barrier to keep some of these insects off the things that you really want to grow, but in some cases they will be floral resources themselves, and so they'll help draw in some of our beneficial insects. So while we're talking about beneficial insects, I do just want to give quick lip service to them. Um, I just did a two and a half hour talk on pollinators and beneficial insects. So I lament that I have but one slide to give them today. Uh, however, this is one of the biggest reasons that um, I think we need to be careful with our uh, organic pesticide application or our organic practices uh, because uh, our beneficial insects, which are our pollinators of which we see a couple here, we've got a squash bee and we've got a, an Eastern tiger swallowtail, um, are are oftentimes going to be uh, critically important to the success of our garden. Um, but then we also have some others like our lacewing and our praying mantis over here on the right um, that are gonna provide kind of continual maintenance and, and upkeep uh, by being predators that are going to feed on things. Uh, and so if we're not careful, if we're indiscriminate with the use of our uh, pesticide applications, and this is uh, organic or otherwise, uh, our beneficial in insects end up being the baby thrown out with the bathwater, uh, which is why we do have to be so careful. So another question that comes up a lot is dealing with diseases in the garden from an organic perspective. Uh, and when we talked about earlier uh, for garden planning, uh, choosing disease resistant varieties to begin with is probably the best way you can start off. And that's why I said don't necessarily get too much tunnel vision on just organic seed uh, it's better to do research and look at the potential diseases that uh, you could encounter um, and then try and select seed that is resistant to that. And then once you have a good practice in place, uh, then maybe you can start experimenting with varieties that are less resistant or more susceptible, uh, but may provide a more desirable product. Another big thing is to harvest on time, uh, leaving any crop residues, especially, uh, you know, fruit maybe that you know got pecked by a bird or something like that it wasn't good enough to harvest so you leave it in the field uh, allowing that to linger in the field uh, builds up uh, pathogen reservoirs so once these start to rot and decay uh, all sorts of bacteria and fungi move in and if your plants become stressed then they can can move into otherwise healthy plants and before you know it you've got a big issue on your hands uh, one thing I'm sure we're all quite familiar with at this point is maintaining good hygiene. I'm sure we're all uh, washing our hands frequently, um, but beyond just washing your hands, uh, it's best if you do smoke or use tobacco, try not to use it in the garden if at all possible. Um, you know, I understand maybe you're outside and it's your leisure time and you want to do it, but uh, tobacco can vector mosaic viruses, which can be very hard to deal with. So be very, very careful with that. Also, we don't recommend working plants when they're wet. Uh, when they're wet, they're generally gonna be more susceptible. And again, you could have more issues with disease transmission. Uh, here's a fun tidbit that I found from NC State University about dealing with uh, some fungal diseases as a preventative measure. Uh, and this is mixing one tablespoon of baking soda with one tablespoon of summer horticultural oil. Uh, and then diluting that with a gallon of water to prevent certain fungal diseases such as black spot, uh, powdery mildew, botrytis, and alternaria. Um, so I have not personally employed this, but NC State Extension like uh, UGA Extension is uh, science-based, it is research-based, and so I tend to trust that. Uh, so if you've ever used that in your garden and you've had success, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, here's another uh, technique that can be employed for stubborn areas, uh, like potentially this bed here, which is solarization, uh, whereby you will use white or clear plastic. Don't use black plastic because you want the UV penetration, uh, but you need it around one to four mils thick. 
tightly wrapped over an affected area to combat disease. So uh, you can weigh it down with, you know, two by fours, bricks, stones, anything like that. Uh, but that area has to remain tightly covered for eight to 12 weeks of warm, sunny weather, because effectively you are baking this space, you are cooking this space. Um, so solarization is really meant to be used uh, in areas where you've had uh, problems, maybe multiple seasons, you've had multiple crop failures, especially uh, if you are uh, being good about your rotation uh, and you're, you're getting diseases across groups, or maybe you're, you're getting disease presentation for something that is uh, more broad spectrum, affects multiple groups of, of plants. This is an organic strategy. Um, you know, it's interesting too that the image I've chosen here is a bed because the alternative to that is of course just replacing all of the soil in that bed, you know, giving it a good clean and replacing all the soil. Uh, solarization I think might be, you know, perhaps more necessary in a field setting or a typical in-ground garden, but regardless it is a strategy to deal with it. So before we wrap up here, uh, I did want to point you all in the direction of a few good resources just to get you started. This is, of course, not all inclusive, and there's there's many things I know I've omitted here uh, for the sake of brevity. Uh, so if it's not listed here and it's your favorite organic blog or there's a book that you love, don't think that uh, I've excluded it on purpose. It's just, you know, we only have so much time to talk about it, and I try to uh, really just post things that are germane to uh, things here in Georgia. Uh, but of course, if you're not already aware of it, we have our online publication library. I pulled a fair amount of information for, for this talk from Bulletin 1011. Uh, so if you just go on Google and search UGA Publication Library, uh, it should pop right up and there's a nice search box on there that you, you can look for stuff. Uh, beyond that, we have the, uh, the Center for Urban Ag has a lot of great resources, especially, you know, I work in Rockdale uh, and I live in DeKalb. So we deal with a lot of urban ag questions, and it seems like that's where a lot of folks that are uh, really starting to get interested in the organic movement uh, live and work. And so this is another place I would direct you to. Uh, I'll uh, post again here, SARE, which I mentioned early on in the talk. Uh, they can be very producer fo focused, I'll say, um, but their information is sound and their information is solid. So even if it is scaled higher or scaled further than the average home gardener, there's a lot of great information there. And then a couple other or organizations here within Georgia, uh, Georgia Organics is excellent. Um, they, they do a lot of great work with our local farmers and they do a great job of outreach and trying to get information to folks. Uh, Georgia Grown is also great. It is not explicitly organic, um, but it can help you find things that are locally grown and locally sourced uh, if that's what you're most interested in. Uh, so with that, I'll leave this slide up for just a couple seconds um, that has uh, my information here. Um, I, I can provide this to y'all and you should actually have my email address if you got the link today. Uh, so if you'd like to reach out to me, please feel free to use that email address. I also have my Rockdale County email address here. Um, within my email signature, uh, we should also have uh, the office address if you are local to the area. Uh, we are partially open right now and we're on a by appointment only basis, but if you wanna come in for soil testing or water testing, or you've got a weed ID or plant ID question, uh, you can always call us up at that number we've got listed there and we'd be happy to see you. I'm in the office on Mondays and Thursdays, um, but you know we'll, we can try and make arrangements, You know, and if you need to just drop off a diagnostic sample, you can basically do that anytime during the week. Um, so with that, I'm gonna open up the chat now because I see y'all have been quite chatty. Let me just uh, close out of this and see if I can get it open. Let's see. Okay, Amy, do you have the chat available? Can you see it? Uh, yes, uh huh. I do. You've got a couple of questions. One about neem oil. Okay, let me back on. Let me see if I can back on up to the top here. Yes, I just had it hidden there. So, okay, yeah. So, planting my garden and using neem oil for pests. Looking forward to hear more about organic gardening. So, yeah, neem is a horticultural oil. Um, for those of y'all that may not be aware, that's one of the things that I mentioned. It is 
It has multiple different applications um, and, and certain ones have different activity. For pest control in particular, it, uh, one critical thing uh, is that you need to have full coverage of pests. Uh, because it works uh, as a suffocating agent. It is a physical control. And so it can be useful for certain pests um, like aphids and uh, like mealybugs and things like that. Just make sure that you affect uh, good uh, coverage when, you, when you're applying uh, it. So somebody else asked about the PowerPoint being emailed. Um, one of the other things I did wanna mention before we finish up here, uh, let me go ahead and post this in chat, is that I have a survey. Uh, and if you will fill this out, I will happily send this to you after the fact. Um, but this really helps us with our demographics, uh, really helps us make sure that we've got, um, we've hit all the demographics that we wanted to. Uh, so if you could please just fill this out, it would only take you know maybe three minutes um, but if you fill this out, we'll be happy to uh, send either a video recording of this talk or the PowerPoint itself to folks that have participated. So let's see. So great chart of materials and rates. Where can we find this chart? Uh, so that chart um, came from NC State's, uh, NC State's organics chapter. So you can find it online. Uh, we have similar charts through that bulletin that I mentioned uh, that um, 1011 is our organic gardening through UGA, but NC State is another uh, resource that I pulled uh, a fair amount of information from uh, this or from that publication for this talk. So access to a replay, yeah, as I mentioned, please fill out that survey and we'll be happy to send that along to you. Thank you for answering that, Amy. Uh, our extension office is currently open. So yeah, I, I kind of touched that on. Uh, uh, a second ago, touched on that a second ago rather. Some are and some aren't. I think it is good to call uh, regardless before just turning up just in case they're closed. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, but uh, as I said, we are partially open. So if you're in the sort of South Metro area or Rockdale area, um, yeah, we can, we can definitely help you out with soil testing. Um, but if you're not there, I would call your closest spot. Oh, and I see Amy, you mentioned that. Inviting James to my house for a barbecue so he can help me with my garden. Hey, you know, I'll wear my mask and, you know, we'll stay six feet apart and I'll take it to go plate, but I'll be happy to help, you know. Uh, heard conflicting opinions. Are roly polies harmful to my garden? It seems like I, I'm getting more and more. First, it was just a few and now, now in one garden bed, it's hundreds of them. So roly polies, um, they're not actually insects. They are crustaceans. And so they are much more closely related to our shrimps. Uh, and our lobsters than they are our uh, typical insects. Um, but they are, uh, they're not a harmful organism. They're actually good at nutrient cycling. They are decomposers. And so they're gonna help to cycle some of that organic matter. So they're gonna help to actually break things down. One thing that is indicative of their presence is high moisture. Uh, they actually have gills, they have book gills. And so they can only live in pretty humid environments. Uh, if it dries out too much for them, they're not going to live. live. Um, so you may have too much moisture, which we've had a fair amount of rainfall, um, but that might be something to, uh, if, you, if you have irrigation going or a sprinkler or something, you may think about dialing that back or investigating the area you're seeing a lot of them. So baking soda method killed my garden beans. Neem oil seems to be working, but it's expensive. So as I said, I've never tried that baking soda method um, with a lot of things, and that that is something I, I, I didn't mention too on that slide, is that uh, it does have to be applied every three to four days. Um, and so, you know, you can get issues with toxicity and burn if, if things are too frequent, uh, but also the, the water droplets themselves, depending on the time of day that they're applied, can also magnify the sun and, and cause issues with burn. So it's hard to say uh, because I've not employed it myself, um, but I'm glad to see that the neem is working, even if it is a bit expensive. Uh, anything like this in the Northeast? Yeah, so there's, there's any number of uh, extension offices. Uh, Cornell is one of the preeminent extension offices, so I would absolutely recommend their, their resources. Penn State also has a great program. Um, but yeah, if, if you're looking for uh, resources outside of the Southeast, 
I highly recommend checking out uh, kind of your local state's extension service because there are, you know, anywhere there's a land grant university, chances are there's going to be some type of active extension service. Um, so we've got another one. Problem with my roses. Uh, let's see, use seven, but I think this kills bees. I don't want to do that. What else can I use? So for the seven dust, if, if I'm interpreting that correctly, yes, is a broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, so yeah, especially if you're putting it on actively blooming flowers that can have really nasty off-target effects. So I wouldn't really recommend it. For your roses in particular, it would be hard for me to make a recommendation without seeing them. Uh, if you would like, after the talk is done here, to send us a, uh, or send me rather some pictures, if you can take some good pictures of it, uh, and just send them along, I'd be happy to do my best to diagnose it. And if I can't do it, I will send it up the chain to some of our ornamental specialists to see if we can get you a better recommendation. Um, we do also have the UGA Pest Management Handbook for homeowners is available online. Um, it's, it's free, it's available online. However, without knowing what the problem is, I can't tell you what from that book you should use. So please, if you'd like, you know, please send us some, uh, you know, some pictures to my email address and I'll, I'll do my best to try and get you a diagnosis. Why are some of my pepper plants growing tall and leafly, but no peppers slash fruit? And then I have some pepper plants that are short and small, but are growing peppers. So that to me indicates um, probably a discrepancy in a couple of different things. Um, one of them that jumps out, uh, that sort of tall or lankiness uh, with vegetative growth without uh, peppers might be an overabundance of nitrogen, uh, an overabundance of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and it may also be influenced by the topography of the land. You know, if you applied the same amount in both places, but one spot is maybe getting more water than the other, or maybe one spot drains a little better than the other, um, you may have leaching of nutrients. And so uh, maybe one just didn't quite get as much. So maybe they're, they're a little nitrogen poor. Um, but that discrepancy uh, does sound to me like maybe an issue uh, with nutrient content. I mean, there could be other things at play. Uh, sunlight, of course, could influence that temperature, but assuming they're all co-located, that would be my guess. And that is also assuming they're all the same variety and you don't have, you know, uh, serranos next to jalapenos, next to ghosts, next to shishitos or whatever, because um, those, of course, will grow at different rates. Any suggestion on how to prevent zucchini from rotting? Mine are dying from the flower and rotting back towards the stem. So, um, that sounds like potentially a calcium deficiency um, that leads to blossom end rot in our tomatoes. Um, it could be other um, fungal issues. Um, so I think the, the go-to would be just like with those roses that I mentioned earlier, um, to send me some pictures of that so I can get a better look at it because there could be fungal problems, especially with our, our high humidity and our are changing, especially this past week, between warm to very cool while remaining humid and damp, um, or it could be a nutrient deficiency. So if you send me some, some pictures along, uh, I can try and dial in on which exact problem we're looking at and then let you know the best way to correct it. Um, so are your other talks available for viewing, specifically the beneficial insect talk you mentioned? Uh, I will have to check with uh, Gwinnett County uh, because they were uh, they were the ones that hosted it, so they would have the archive. I, I don't have the archive myself. Uh, however, if you'll send me an email after the chat, um, I'll, I'll see if I can touch base with them and see if they have it, because if they do, I'd, I'd be happy to send along to you. I planted pepper seeds. They sprouted and then nothing. They are starting to die. Um, so it will depend on when you planted them. I think, like I said, one of the most important factors uh, that goes into garden planning and planting is uh, going to be soil temperature. And so our soils remained pretty cool until uh, really into to mid to late May, I feel like was when we started to get high enough because the, those soil temperatures really have to be uh, well over 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there, of course, could be other factors as well. You know, uh, maybe they dried out a bit, you know, depending on if you were irrigating them. Uh, or they maybe have just gotten burned in the sun, you know. Uh, there's a lot of factors at play. Uh, if you're having issues with starting from seed, I would definitely recommend uh, going with starts. Uh, even if you, you don't get the full experience of seed starting, 
Um, you know, then you can get something and you can get organic starts if you want. We bought organic starts for our porch garden. Uh, so that's certainly an option available too. Um, but in that case, it may be better to get something that is already started and established and is going to be a little bit hardier uh, because starting from seed, especially sowing directly in the ground, can be very difficult in some cases. So what is a good food to help my watermelon plants grow? They are starting small. This is first year of this garden bed, so soil is bought and might not be good. What can I add to feed the watermelon plants? So uh, I'd have to go back and get you an exact specific recommendation, but you know, watermelon plants have a, a long time to maturity in the field. Uh, so they will, they will likely need uh, some additional fertility over the course of the growing season. Um, I know uh, you're the same person that, you know, you said you were going to send a picture so of your roses. So I'll, I'll look at getting you a specific recommendation for your watermelons. Um, we've grown them in our, our master gardener's planter row garden, um, but I haven't actively dealt with the fertility management. So I'll see if I can get you a good recommendation on that. Uh, Epsom salt, good to use in veggie garden. How do you test your soil temperature? Is there a tool? What temp should a veggie garden be? So Epsom salt, I think in extreme moderation, because again, it is a salt um, that, you know, you can have issues with, uh, you know, kind of uh, over salinification of your soil. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times people add it, I think for the potassium aspect of it. Um, and in that case, there are probably better sources to get it uh, that you can avoid kind of that salinity issue. Um, so to the question about testing your soil, they do make actual soil thermometers. Um, you can really use any thermometer as long as it gets down low enough, you know, because a lot of cooking thermometers simply aren't going to be low enough in that range for, for what we're looking for, which as I said before is, you know, generally in, in around the 65 degree range. And that is at, you know, around a six inch depth at the actual root zone depth. Um, there are also online resources. If you, if you just searched uh, Georgia uh, soil temperature on Google, you should be able to find a website that you can put in your location and it'll give you your soil temperature and give you an idea of where it's at. So we got somebody else said, I'm a beginner starting with a raised bed garden. If I want to ease into organic gardening, what's the most important way to start? Uh, focus on the soil. So yeah, I think soil's a good thing to start with, and I just didn't have time to cover it today, but uh, you know, raised beds and containers are a great way to dip your toe in the water of organic, uh, and you can certainly buy bagged soil, which again, just like our organic uh, fertilizers, can oftentimes be more complete in terms of their nutrient complement than some of our inorganic fertilizers. Um, however, I think if you're just getting started with a raised bed, uh, it should be much more important to plant things first and foremost that you will use. Um, you know, plant things that you know that you're interested in and that you know you'll use because then I feel like you'll be more invested in spending time in the garden if it's something that you're excited about harvesting and you have a plan to use. Um, but I think you should also just make sure the basics are taken care of. Um, and then as far as your basic strategies for a, a, state, a space as small as a raised bed, I mean, you can scout that easily in 10 minutes. So if you start having weed problems or you start having uh, pest problems, you can be on top of it like that. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to invest in anything crazy. Like you don't need to go out and buy a tiller. Uh, you don't need to have a backpack sprayer. Uh, you can maybe get a hand pump sprayer at most if you think about, you know, you might be applying some neem oil or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think if you start with a good uh, soil basis uh, and then you plant uh, sort of mindful to things that you will actually use and things that will uh, go together well for the space that you have, you know, one of our biggest principles is right plant, right place. So make sure you're planting things that will utilize the amount of sun you get got and how much water. Um, then from there, you can kind of ease into some of the organic practice and, you know, there's no shame if you, you feel like you're just getting started. And, and as I said at the beginning, if you want to use inorganic fertilizers, just to make sure you're at a good level as you get started, and then you kind of build up from there. Uh, or if you want to go whole hog, you know, there's, there's plenty of resources out there that will they'll show you how to do it. Um, but 
you know, it's trial and error. And, and we've had some very accomplished gardeners come speak at our office to our master gardeners that one of their, you know, main focuses is that um, their gardens are littered with their failures and mistakes. Uh, so don't be afraid to experiment and don't be afraid uh, for failure to come rest on your doorstep because even for people with the greenest of thumbs, uh, they inevitably have mistakes or accidents or end up killing plants. So don't, you know, don't fret about that too much. Let's see, thank you for filling out the survey for those of y'all that have. Uh, I really appreciate it. And if you haven't already, I'm going to toss it again here in chat. Um, let me back up a little bit, just see if I've got mostly everybody. It looks like everybody else is just saying thanks. And I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, uh, Amy, thank you for posting about our extension channel. Um, and here we've got a, a, another question. Um, what's the proper time of day to water? Uh, so typically you, you want that foliage to be uh, damp for as little time as possible, especially, you know, well, given if you're using overhead irrigation, so a sprinkler uh, or anything like that, or, or a hose. Um, ideally, if, if you can deliver that water early in the morning or late in the evening, is the best time to water because then you can allow that that soil to uh, percolate down to that root zone uh, and you're not going to have issues necessarily uh, with the the soil remaining too damp or with the foliage remaining damp if, if you're watering from overhead um, so of course that's going to vary too depending on how hot things are or how recently it's rained but general rule of thumb is between 9 p.m and 9 a.m uh, is best for lawns um, but it may be, you know, what's most practical for you. Um, but if you can, you know, if you get out there first thing in the morning or better yet, if you can set up an irrigation system with a weep hose and a timer, it'll make it a breeze and then you don't even have to think about it. All right, looks like we've had plenty of people come through. Thank you so much for filling out the survey. Excellent. And Jeanette, no need to be uh, no need to be hard on yourself. Like I said, every everybody has plenty of mistakes. Everybody has failures, uh, and that's what we're here to do. Is we're here to help y'all be successful the best we can and provide you with the best knowledge. So even if it seems overwhelming, you feel like you need more information, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Um, but otherwise, I, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, if y'all have any more questions, or I didn't get to a question, or you you have anything else. Uh, please, you know, feel free to, to email me, to call me, uh, to reach out to Amy. Uh, you know, she's a great resource also, uh, and we can try and get you the best info uh, that we can. But thank you all so much for coming out today.